Hello, guys and girls. The program you are about to hear will be both fun and educational, but it is not a substitute for medical advice. Although we are doctors, we are not your doctors. Hello and welcome to Travel Medicine. As always, I'm your friendly neighborhood internal medicine doc, Dr. J. Hi everybody, this is Dr. Santosh, your pediatric infectious disease doc and researcher recovering from laryngitis. Recovering from con. Some of you yeah. may have noticed <laughs> there was no episode last week, but there was. You just couldn't hear it because it was live. <laughs> and, and due to some technical difficulties, will be re-recorded and re-released at a near yeah. future date. Everybody out there, uh, especially if you're a new listener and you came to Chicago C2E2 uh, this past uh, April April 2nd uh, of 2023, we're so, so grateful. Um, it was a beautiful turnout, and we had lots of people asking wonderful questions. And so thanks to all of you who showed up. We'll be hopefully doing lots, lots more live events uh, coming up because we loved it. Uh, folks at C2E2, we appreciate you. Those of you who have recently subscribed, welcome. You're in for a treat. Boy, I I wish I was you so I could <laughs> hear me for the first time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, so <laughs> I'm sorry i'm a little punchy <laughs> so jealous as we take <laughs> as we take a break from comics santosh we had been doing a whole series on on senses and the way they relate to medicine uh for example the sense of sight is what guides us right when we go out on walks the sense of smells the way you tell that you need to change your socks the sense of touch is what hurts so much when you bang your toe on the bed. The sense of hearing is something good. Because if a tree falls in the wood, would there be a sound? You bet there would. If it landed on top of your head, your head. If a tree lands on top of your head. Uh, anyway, we have been doing a whole bunch of, well, non-audio topics in an audio medium. And I figured yeah. we'd continue. <laughs> When you challenged me to make an episode about the smells of medicine. Yeah, yeah. I We had gone through the uh, the sound, I believe, of medicine. We went through the taste of medicine, uh, which was a little weird and wacky. And then I said, well, you know, Josh, we can maybe stop there. I mean, what are you going to do next? Like the smell of medicine? Like that's, you know. Smell uh, vision. <laughs> so those of you at home... Be prepared to go running to your pantry, bathroom. I don't know. We may we may have things for you to smell, or we may ruin certain <laughs> smells for you forever over the course of the next hour. I think they should join the rest of us, Josh, in the smell ruining thing. I don't know if this happened to you, but when I was doing anatomy, and it was the very first time, and there is a stench of formaldehyde in that laboratory. Um, by the way, much respect to everybody who donated their bodies. Thank you so much. We, we learned so much from you. But when we went in there, it was very, very smelly. And then, of course, like we finished anatomy lab in the morning and we had to go eat. And whatever we ate next was ruined for us for a little bit because it that lingering smell of formaldehyde just made whatever we were eating taste of formaldehyde. I don't no, know if that there were only you. two reactions in the anatomy lab. One yeah. was, I am now vegan. And the oh. other was, <laughs> who wants burritos? I'm starving. <laughs> and we've talked about okay. this. Yeah, but, that's true. And, and I'm glad you bring up anatomy lab. But usually if we're thinking smells long ago and perhaps far, far away, yeah. <laughs> smell was crucial to describing illness. Infectious diseases yes. were all known by their characteristic odors. They were like, you know, the most disgusting Pokemon ever. Uh, scrofula <laughs> was stale beer. Typhoid, oh. freshly baked bread. Rubella, oh. one of my favorites. Rubella, like plucked feathers. A lot of people walking around sniffing chickens. And, okay. dipth and diphtheria was described as sweet-ish. Oh, um, okay. 
Hippocrates sniffed patients' breaths for a fishy odor to diagnose liver failure. And okay. yes. Surgeon General John Rollo, head of the British Royal Artillery, noted that diabetes sufferers exhibited the odor of decaying apples. Oh, okay. So that because you have alcohol mixed with the sweetness as it starts to rot. So that makes a lot of sense. So nowadays, Josh, and, and I'm giving away a little bit because it sounds a little bit scary, but when we're in the microbiology lab, one of the first things that you actually learn, you're not supposed to like stick your face in a vat of bacteria and smell, but you can waft the the plates, the agar plates where bacteria are growing a little bit under your nose, and you will get some of these smells. And it has to do with the odorants that the bacteria produce as they're metabolizing things like sugar or the blood agar that they're put on. So famously, pseudomonas, um, which can happen in infected wounds, has a fruity smell like grapes almost. And you can actually couple that with their very green color and say, oh, that's pseudomonas, even before you do any test to say what it is. I have to remember which one. I think it might be serratia um, or one of the others, which has like a, um, a stinky socks kind of smell, like gym socks. Kind of I'm thing. just picturing a bunch of scientists waving their agar plates around like yes. wine tasters. Yeah. <laughs> being, oh, Pseudomonas 2022, a very pandemic year. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. That, that's a fair way to think about it. <laughs> kind of makes scientists see. I, I don't even know how, yeah. how that changes my perception, but that's it. You're all walking yeah. around at like agar parties yeah. being, have you smelled... <laughs> Have you spelled my scrofula, the freshest brown bread you're ever going to notice? <laughs> it is it, before good health and safety practices were instituted, you know, in order to protect the scientists themselves. And we had all of these molecular methods and everything else like that. The smell of the disease often was the smell of whatever the bacteria or the fungus or the mycobacteria for tuberculosis it was metabolizing, it was eating the tissue, and then it would give off byproducts. A lot like when you or I, you know, if we eat and then we exercise, or if we have asparagus and then we pee, right? It's the same kind of thing. Those, those little critters are just making byproducts. Some of them are volatile, meaning that they're airborne, and we can smell them and they're quite distinctive. So it, it, it makes sense that it carried over into the lab and it still does. But yeah, don't, if you're doing like at home microbiology, which is sometimes a lot of fun to do, don't sniff your plates a lot. Because and definitely be, don't sip and spit them because that will no, end no. poorly. <laughs> which was also a thing way back when, but yeah, don't do that. <laughs> well, the ancient Greeks and Chinese had a very interesting method of detecting tuberculosis. Uh, Chinese doctors would set fire to the patient's sputum, and Ooh. then they would recognize a specific smell in the fumes. Oh, that makes sense. Okay, so you're you're basically uh, aerosolizing or volatilizing, you know, the the um, smellable chemicals. And then, of course, you start seeing the use of perfumes in the 17th and 18th century uh, mm -hmm. for therapeutic fragrances and. The idea that body odors or odors can indicate illness may have actually backfired for a while in the sense that rather than say, oh, this smells associated with this diagnosis, it led to the miasma theory of illness associated with bad smells, meaning, oh, I smell something bad, this smell itself could make me sick, rather than it being an indication that, oh, I am ill and therefore giving off this odor. Got it. Okay. So um, basically, we worked through the logic backwards, but given the knowledge that we had at the time, it makes sense. And one of the things I want to mention is in August and September of 1880, we're just going to peek through the windows of the Wayback Machine. Oh, sure. In August and September of 1880, all of Paris was suffused by an odor so putrid. So oh, no. nauseating, oh, no. so fetid <laughs> that it sparked immediate fears of an epidemic, rumors of death throughout the city, bold citizens protesting, and the formation of a government commission, including a name you may recognize, 
Louis Pasteur to handle oh. the great stink of Paris. <laughs> okay, okay. So don't now, hold us in too much suspense. What was it? Now that, well, that could be an episode in and of itself, and I'm going to bring it a little bit more local, but okay. I brought it up because it led to the commission ended up creating a fundamental principle of germ theory that countered the miasma theory. And I, oh. I can't say French, so I'm going to mispronounce this, and then I'll tell you the translation. Tout ce qui ne pas, et tout ce qui ne pas. Don't at me. It stands for not everything that stinks kills, and not everything that kills stinks. stinks. That <laughs> That is a wonderful scientific way of kind of subtracting out the pieces of what's important and leaving what's left. Uh, I, I love this because this wasn't, you know, the, the heart and soul of germ theory, but you were subtracting away one of the possibilities. You were taking out, oh, you know what? We really thought that this was a thing, um, that it was, you know, miasma and smell and all that kind of a thing, but it's it's really not. So, okay, now we've got to find out what it is. And this kind of opens up the way of for, oh, there's other things that cause disease. But, you know, logically, it made a ton of sense that, you know, hey, it stinks. It, it must be it must be disease. So in the late 1800s, early 1900s, as the miasma theory is slowly falling out of fashion, you have women and men carrying around perfumed handkerchiefs smelling salts, sachets, or nosegay, which was just a fragrant flower pinned to your label to make your nose happy mm -hmm. uh, yep. or gay, so that yep. when you encountered a bad odor, you could cover your nose or bury it in the flower. So in 1862, when Chicago's aldermen formed one of my favorite phrases, they formed a smelling committee to investigate the source of the city's foul odors. Oh, that, that needs to come back, Josh. We, we need more smelling committees. Well, well, we need more smelling committees. We certainly don't want them investigating Chicago because that would mean we would have some issues with the river. Oh, that's and true. Yes. Chicago is no longer the land of wild, stinking onions. Oh, uh, so okay. The smelling committee, was the, their job was to travel up and down the river in August to report on the water quality of the Chicago River. And okay. this would be in a little boat, the mayor, the sanitary superintendent, the health officer, and a few others. And they would board it in the main branch and head south towards the noteworthy 12th Street and 18th Street smells, distinctive enough to have their own names and sites, such as the water came up thick and black, covered with a filthy froth and bubbles of gas, while a terrible stench rose over the inkiness. At the end of that trip, the one that I just described, the Tribune yeah. reporter on board wrote, the river is greatly improved since the last inspection. Okay. <laughs> okay. So right. now that we've had our fun with history, let's talk about, we all know, or at least you've probably heard about animals smelling diseases. Yes. Yeah. And that's even a, a modern thing. Absolutely. But I'm more interested in, do you think humans have noses that can discriminate disease odors from other humans, you know, without wafting a plate full of bacteria in your face? Sure. <laughs> uh, possibly. I know that we're not going to be as good at this than like a dog, for instance. Doggies are amazing. So to test this hypothesis... Let's find out what, let's head over to Sweden, where okay. researcher Mats Olsen of the Karolinska Institute wanted to see if people could detect disease in sweat. So he had eight healthy people visit his lab to be injected with either lipopolysaccharide, which just is a, ramps up your immune response, okay, or a saline solution, so your control group. Okay. So the volunteers wore tight t-shirts to absorb sweat over the course of four hours. And everybody who got the LPS injection did get an immune response with elevated body temperature and cytokines. So they weren't oh. giving them an actual disease, but they were provoking the same kind of response your body would have if it had any infection, because that's what he wanted to test. Could people detect 
the presence of an infection from just smell alone. Okay, okay. Now, once those eight volunteers had been sweating into these t-shirts, a separate group of 40 participants were instructed to smell the sweat samples. Overall, t-shirts from the LPS group were rated as having a more intense and unpleasant smell than the saline group, and they also said it was an unhealthier smell, which could be, so the, the more your immune response was activated, the more unpleasant your sweat smelled. Oh, okay. That makes sense because, all right, you're, you're creating different metabolites or I guess different volatile chemicals if you're killing off the bacteria versus if the bacteria themselves are proliferating. Now that we know that you can just kind of smell the immune response, let's get into diseases. Now, Santosh, in a hospital setting, mm -hmm. what do you suppose is the easiest disease to smell and who's the most likely to smell it? <laughs> uh, for me, I would almost 100% say diarrhea. It's, you know, when there's, when there's diarrhea happening in any particular room, uh, followed by or maybe beaten slightly by uh, vomit. Vomit can really, really stink. So I, I think either of those, one of those GI expulsions. Yeah, something that's spewing from one end or the other. Sure. And who is going to be the first to notice that? Probably the, a nurse or maybe even a patient. Got it in one. Well, probably oh. the nurse first. Okay, gotcha. Because yeah, um, yeah. you're a little bit less sensitive to the smells that you yourself are giving off. Right. Okay, gotcha. So 1987, and I, I find it hard to believe that it didn't happen till, bef till before then, but 1987, the human nose was first tested in distinguishing diarrhea caused by rotavirus compared sure. mm -hmm. to diarrhea caused by other organisms like adenovirus, E. coli, Campylobacter. And they got a group of nurses together and asked them to classify stool samples by smell. Now, interestingly, specificity was fantastic, 88%, but sensitivity was very low, only about 38%. So right. if the nurses said this doesn't smell, infected yes. mm -hmm. you could Correct. trust them but if they said i think this might be infected you'd still need to test it yes exactly so sensitivity is the ability for any test so in this case it's a schnoz but a, t a test to be able to say if there is disease in there yes i can properly detect the disease specificity is the ability for that test to say if there truly is absence of disease, how accurate are you? How, how well can you say that there is no disease in here? So, yeah, they, they were very good at excluding. But so they, they were probably saying that, like, OK, there's a distinct lack of smell. So I'm pretty sure it's not rotavirus. But then what was probably happening with the other smelly diarrheas was it's really tough to tell between rota and probably other bacteria and viruses and that kind of a thing in, in this study. Now, while we mentioned the distinctive odors of a few diseases earlier, you don't really smell a lot of scrofula or tuberculosis these days. We've got a, yeah. we've got a good handle on those. Well, yeah, yeah. We, we shouldn't be, sni especially don't be smelling for tuberculosis. There's a lot of tuberculosis in the world, but don't smell for it, please. There are, however, several rare metabolic diseases that each have such a distinct smell that they owe their name to it. Very pleasant, but is also not good to have. Maple syrup urine disease. No, yeah. you don't pee Aunt Jemima. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is, it's actually quite dangerous. So these are diseases of metabolism, right? We have pathways to utilize and then break down the amino acids that we have in our body, especially if there's excess. If we lack certain enzymes, then we don't break down those amino acids properly. So you get an amino acid urea. And each of those amino acids are, they're quite frequently found in food, right? Because that's how we get our amino acids. So some of them taste, smell, look like 
certain compounds. So, yeah. so specifically, if you have amino acids that have branched side chains, so, you know, you, it, there's a specific enzyme that's missing and, you know, you, you kind of have an excess or a buildup of these branch chain amino acids and they end up in your urine and they're sweet-ish smelling, right? So <laughs> you end up, if you taste it, I guess it's very, very sweet. Um, but more often than not, you're smelling it when it's in the toilet and it gives off that kind of sugary, smoky, you know, maple syrup kind of a smell. So let's do, uh, let's do a little game, Santosh. Oh, okay, okay. It's it's a game that I like playing on another trivia podcast called Brad Pitt or Lasers. And <laughs> okay. it's just we're going to do okay. a one question game yeah. and I'm simply going to ask you Ooh. which Ooh. came first. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. All right. <laughs> a little the the discovery of olfactory receptors allowing us to really explore the world of smell. Mhm. Okay. Or the TV show mm, Home Improvement. <laughs> well, that's like Home Improvement was in the 1990s, I think. This can't be a trick question. I'm, I'm pretty sure. Okay, I, I'm going to say we knew that there had to be an olfactory receptor before home improvement, but I think you're trying to trick me. So I'm going to say the discovery of the actual structure, like the little cell or molecule of the actual receptor was discovered after the 1990s. So after home improvement. I like that your reasoning is inherently distrustful. Okay. <laughs> Okay, okay. But you are, in fact, correct. Home Improvement went on air in 1991. Okay. In the beginning of the year. Mm. Whereas modern research on smell was revolutionized with the discovery of olfactory receptors by Linda Buck and Richard Axel in summer of 1991. After oh, wow. Home Improvement. Okay, okay. <laughs> there. Cool. Their discovery gave us the whole entity to model how smell works, and mm -hmm. they won the 2004 Nobel Prize in the physio in physiology or medicine. Oh, that's so neat! Oh my god! Okay, so I I think we all knew we we said okay, there has to be some sort of a mechanism where a volatile chemical, you know that that means it floats around it. It can go from easily from a surface to into the air. That's what volatile means. There has to be a way that that volatile chemical stimulates something in our nose and then we inhale it and then, you know, it sticks there and then it sends a signal to our brain. But okay, the discovery then, the like what it actually looked like, the receptor. We couldn't even point. picture how it might work till we discovered it. And that didn't happen until after 1991. Oh. So... <laughs> So, after so that, oh man! So wow. your ability to see. So we were alive when smells were discovered. <laughs> well, when the the smeller was discovered, like the the how to smell thingy. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. When when they who smelt it dealt it. <laughs> were they dealt a prize? They were dealt a prize. <laughs> so let's let's talk briefly about how smelling works. Your yes. ability to smell comes from very specialized sensory cells that are found in a teeny patch of tissue way high up in the nose. These cells connect directly to the brain and each olfactory neuron has one odor receptor. Okay. So as you mentioned, molecules released by substances around us, whether it's coffee, pine trees, gasoline, whatever, stimulate these receptors. When the neurons detect the molecules, they send a message to the brain, which identifies the smell. Now, here's the key. There are more smells in the environment than there are receptors, and any given molecule may stimulate a combination of receptors, creating a unique pathway in the brain. So you don't have, you know, paint thinner olfactory neuron and candy olfactory neuron. You have two neurons 
or five or seven that when they combine give you the sensation of oh this smells like candy or this smells like petrichor the smell of rain oh oh Uh, yeah yeah that's the um well it's it's actually the dirt and the the the, uh, grass releasing that after the the rain hits it okay cool so you get you know, these smell patterns that your brain then turns into a specific smell. So how do smells actually reach the olfactory sensory neurons? Yes, the first and most obvious pathway is through your nostrils. But the second is through a channel that connects the roof of the throat to the nose. So when you chew food, you're grinding, mashing it up, releasing aromas that the olfactory neurons can sense through the roof of your throat. So if that channel is blocked, like if your nose is stuffed up by a cold or flu, odors can't reach the sensory cells that are stimulated by smells, so you lose your ability to enjoy a food's flavor or it tastes bland. So that's why smell and taste work closely together. Yeah, and that, I I think, Josh, we talked a little bit about this way back when, when we did our gastro psychology, our gastronomy episode, but that smell working together with the taste and you know kind of giving you those good feelings about food we underestimated for a very long time how important that is for you know as just one of the basic pleasures of life and this is still something that we lean on pretty heavily especially in our kids when we're talking about uh okay are they recovering from an illness are they getting better Smell and taste are a really big part of them having just general pleasure in life and avoiding things like depression. Uh, And it can also help people a little bit when they're in states of kind of dementia to stimulate memories and kind of get them back reoriented because it's that important to us. People can get very, very sad and sick when they lose that sense. And that has been coupled a little bit with the feelings of kind of fatigue, blandness, and fog that go along with like long COVID when they lose their sense of smell. Yeah. So now that we've talked about smelly diseases, let's talk about diseases of smelling. Oh, what yeah, happens absolutely. to change your scent? <laughs> but before we do that, you know what I smell? What do you a smell? A break. Now? I smell a break. (laughs) All right, guys. We'll come back as soon as the smell of break goes away. (laughs) Hey, Santos, pull my finger for a break. Oh, gross. (laughs) You think that was long enough? Did Hopefully everyone heard commercials. (laughs) I I have zero idea. Spotify. Spotify, can you hear us? (laughs) Hopefully you all heard our ads. After that, and not before. (laughs) If not, I've still got editing issues. Feel free to message me and and inform me where these ads are actually landing. Yeah. But diagnosis of smell and diseases. uh, Well, one of the first ones is it has it has a more proper name, and we'll get into it. But I just love that the odor test, Mm -hmm. uh, the is called sniffing sticks. What? <laughs> it's it's not though. Olfaction diseases SST12 sniffing sticks tubes. I don't know. I forget what it stands for, but sniffing okay, sticks. <laughs> That's so cool! Oh my god! It's, it is. It's sniffing sticks. It's a four-minute screening test for odor identification based on 12 of 16 odors being sniffed from this disease. Now, uh, people who work with food probably would be really good at this. And you see some some bastardized version of the sniff and sticks test carried out on a couple of cooking shows. Oh, okay, okay. The original SST odors include, and feel free to gather these from around your home, where Mm -hmm. you will have more than you think. (laughs) Yeah, because these these have to be everyday kind of smells, right? Yes. So uh-huh. here's here's what the smells are, and then we'll tell you how the test works. Peppermint, orange, fish, 
leather, rose, cloves, coffee, pineapple, licorice, anise, which is a bit of a cheat because licorice does smell like anise, but Mm -hmm. lemon, banana, cinnamon, apple, turpentine, and garlic. Oh, very nice. Yeah. Throw in milk and eggs and, you know, you've got yourself a recipe there. So (laughs) during this test, subjects are blindfolded. 16 sticks are presented once, separated by an interval of at least 20 seconds to prevent getting desensitized. And each presentation, each stick is accompanied by a written list containing the correct odorant and three distracting odorants. Oh, ne- <laughs> oh, I see, I see. So not just the ability to smell, but also the ability to kind of detect the odor out of a kind of a gallimaufry. So the same way that you can hear an individual voice in the middle of like a crowded room or that kind of a thing. So that's that's also an important distinction. So okay, instead of the it. eye chart, what's the lowest line you can read? You get blindfolded and like... What's the lowest line you can smell? Yeah. Is it is this cloves, burnt rubber? Sure, sure. Okay, that's fair. But you probably don't remember taking this test because this is not a test we give to everybody. No, 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 no. This is very highly specialized. It is part of a neurological assessment, like a true head-to-toe neurological assessment, because... Anosmia can be part of things like, you know, uh, scary things like dementia, and things like that. But yeah, in an everyday physical, you're not going to be like, <laughs> is this peppermint or leather? <laughs> what, is that yeah. a banana in my pocket or are you just a really good smeller? <laughs> sure. So your ability to smell begins to get weaker after age 50. So we've only got a few good sniffing years in us left, Santosh. Yeah. Oh, no. Well, it starts to diminish. It doesn't go away entirely, but yes, you're right. It and that's because your nasal membranes become thinner and drier. The nerves don't work as well. And if it happens rapidly or with one of these diseases we're about to talk about, you go to see an otolaryngologist. Oto laryngologist an ear nose and throat doctor yes an ent (laughs) and they would be the one who would dish out the sniffing sticks Mm -hmm. or have you sniff a chemical and then would dilute the substance until you can no longer smell it so again can you smell me now no can you smell me now (laughs) no can you smell me now pull my finger (laughs) stop it Yeah. And likewise, the distracting thing you were talking about was that, like, do you smell the banana? And, you know, you add in something else in there. Do you still smell the banana? And can you distinguish it from the, you know, the other smells and that kind of a thing? So it's it's a cool test and not too long either. You said about four minutes, Josh. Yeah. Cool. Four four minutes. Identify as many smells as you can. Not a sentence (laughs) I thought we would ever say on this show. (laughs) Sure. So there's three kind of overall categories of sniffing disease. The first one you already mentioned, anosmia. That means you simply cannot smell. And yes. there's about three major causes of anosmia. Either a swelling or obstruction in the nasal passageways could be due to allergies with chronic congestion, could be due to nasal tumors. But when you block off the passages and molecules can't reach those sensors, you get partial or complete loss of smell. There's also a number of drugs and chemicals that can do this or tumor invasion if the nerves lining the nasal passage are destroyed. So that's the scary ones, right? So if you're evaluating a person for memory problems and We actually have discovered, Josh, that some of these are early signs of these degenerative diseases, which is kind of, it's scary, but it's also good because you can say, oh, you know what, my my mom or dad or grandma or grandpa is starting to lose their memory a little bit because that's the first thing that you'll notice and couldn't remember a name, couldn't remember where they put their keys. But along with that, you're also going to test vision 
because you can have degeneration of the optic nerve or the retina. Um, and you can also say, okay, let's do a, you know, sniff and sticks test because, you know, if they have bad, you know, failure to, to seek out some of these orders and to detect them properly, you're saying that like, those neurons, the the ones that are connecting the nose to the brain, you're using it as kind of a window to the rest of the brain to say, okay, well, if this part isn't working, oh my gosh, there might be other parts inside of the brain that's not working well. So it, it now, it's a of, scary thing. <laughs> of the smelling diseases, anosmy is probably the best known. These sure. next two, little bit well, these next two are a little bit rarer. One is called phantosmia. Now, that doesn't give you the ability to smell ghosts. <laughs> but it does mean that your olfactory system starts hallucinating. You smell odors that aren't really there, but you think they're in your nose or somewhere around you. Now, this can happen after a head injury or a brain tumor or could be an early sign of Parkinson's as well. Yeah. Uh, there are people who have said, and it's a little bit mythological that it, it is linked with the aura of a seizure. So, oh, do you smell burnt toast? So either a stroke or a seizure is about to be coming on. The truth of the matter is, and, and especially for signs of recognizing a stroke, smelling that kind of, you know, odor, smoky odor, sometimes they'll say or burnt toast that's not really there. That's actually quite infrequent as a symptom. But yeah, Parkinson's is a neurological disease. If there's a tumor in the you know frontal lobe where the, that part of your olfactory nerve enters the brain. And then, of course, if you have inflammation or infection going on, where and it sometimes does happen, Josh, that you smell the infection, <laughs> you smell the yucky sinuses, you know, kind of thing going on, and it clouds the rest of the smells around there. Now, the last category and the most rare is called parosmia, and that oh yeah, where you smell fruit, <laughs> where, where you get smells that get completely cross wired. So you sniff a cup of coffee and it smells like gasoline. Or oh, decaying yeah. garbage smells like roses and perfume. Oh, okay. So this is what happened with me with the formaldehyde in the uh, in the anatomy lab, and I came out, and we had Indian food, and the roti smelled like formaldehyde to me. That may have just been formaldehyde particles lingering in your nose. If, Indi <laughs> if Indian food still smells like formaldehyde to you, then yes, that could be cross wiring. And I, I think that's what happened to me afterwards is that the memory of that smell was kind of linked together because that's the first lunch I had, you know, after leaving, which was a bad choice. I it ruined Indian food for me for like a couple of months. But yeah, I guess maybe because long after I had been out of the lab uh, and taken a shower and all that fun stuff, even when I ate for a couple of months after that very first anatomy lab, I got that whiff of a memory of formaldehyde when I would walk into the restaurant. So when should you follow your nose to the doctor? <laughs> well, when you have a bad smell in your nose for longer than a week with no obvious external source, probably worth checking out. For example, in people with kidney disease, if kidneys aren't functioning, you're not making urine or you're not making a lot, Waste materials may build up in the body. Those okay. materials can produce an ammonia-like smell that you may notice in the back of your nose or a metallic taste. But that kind of kidney disease or damage only occurs after it's advanced to near end stage, like four or five, meaning close to the point where you may have to start thinking about dialysis. A simple urinary okay. tract infection isn't going to do this. Sure. Or uh, rather than having a bad smell in your nose for more than one week, you may have no smell. And a lot of people have become much more familiar with a lack of smell, that anosmia, thanks to, oh, you know, the last several years and a little disease <laughs> called COVID. Yeah, yeah. It was one of the first things that was noticed with severe COVID. And even all the way go going back to the original Wuhan strain, Josh, was one of these very, very distinct 
symptoms that popped up. Now, when you get upper respiratory tract infections, some lower respiratory tract infections, there is a tendency for smell to be blunted because, of course, you're you're stuffed up and in some cases you're full of mucus. But this very, very typical anosmia that not only was very severe, like you just shut off smell and taste, but also lingered quite a bit after the COVID, you know, went away. That was so strange. So they actually did a study on this because, you know, losing your sense of smell is uh, rather disturbing to a lot of people. (laughs) Oh, yeah. So of 2,500 COVID-19 patients studied, who had lost their sense of smell, 95% of them regained it within six months. And that was from a study published in the Journal of Internal Medicine. The average time that they were without a sense of smell, or as they call it, olfactory dysfunction, Mm -hmm. was about 21.6 days. Now, it doesn't say after the disease was cured, or after they were hospitalized, whether they were vaccinated or not. This is just if you lost your sense of smell, on average, you lost it for 21 days. Okay, gotcha. All right. Now, about a quarter of those 2,500 patients still hadn't regained their smell and taste within 60 days of infection. So oh, we're still looking at about okay. 25% of people who haven't gotten it back. Now, we're not saying it's permanent. We're just saying that At 60 days, there was still a quarter of people who had not managed to regain their smell. Okay, gotcha. Um, And it's still being studied. So that's really all the information I have for you. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Although we will talk about treatments in a little bit. Uh, But I want to detour to talk about a couple smells you may have noticed throughout your life. Yes, please. The classic smell of B.O., of course. Oh, sure. Sure, sure. We've all smelled it. We've occasionally been the source of it. But why? Why does B.O. smell? Yeah, and I'm guessing that this is somewhat, well, at least a slightly modern thing. Because I know that, you know, for the longest time, we didn't have soap and water. So... I'm guessing that B.O. was normal for a decent amount of time, at least. Yes, but not for the reason you think. So humans have three different kinds of sweat glands, apocrine, eccrine, and sebaceous. Uh, We're going to skip over eccrine glands because they're present all over the body. Apocrine and sebaceous are in certain locations, and body odor is primarily caused by apocrine sweat glands that don't really activate until puberty. Sweat is almost entirely odorless. It's only when the bacteria that normally live on our skin begin metabolizing our sweat that they produce these odoring, these odorant byproducts. And the biggest offenders are from the family Corin bacterium. So Corin bacterium, striatum, bovis, any medium and short chain fatty acids, uh, But interestingly, the smell of sweat, while that's mostly from corn bacterium, if you Mm -hmm. have smelly feet, that's probably staph epidermis, which has degraded Mm -hmm. the leucine in your sweat to a cheesy smelling compound. (laughs) That's the gross stuff. Whereas Staphylococcus hominis makes your underarms (laughs) smell like meat. So there are different kinds... (laughs) I read a lot about sweat, you guys. It was, it was. And what you get then is you get a combination of these. Now, Josh, you actually mentioned, remember at the very beginning, you talked about the smell of diphtheria? Yes. So diphtheria is a carinobacterium. So carinobacterium diphtheriae is the, you know, so it's got its own distinct smell in there too. Stridum, uh, jeckium, they live on our skin. And staphylococcus, people may have heard about from staph aureus, right? One of the most common colonizers on our skin. Staph epi and hominis, likewise, are all over our bodies. Staph hominis, uh, really, it's it, it likes dark, moist, warm places <laughs> under our arms in our groin 
And so that's why you get more of that rotten smell under there, especially after you're a good workout and you sweat. But now you combine some of these odors, right? So you combine the the cheese with the rotten meat, or you combine <laughs> you combine the sweet stuff with the cheese or something. Now you get distinct body odors from different people. <laughs> oh, but it gets better. You oh, see, cool. now okay, we can talk okay. about both gender and and ethnic or racial differences, men, oh, yeah, okay. men have larger sweat glands and generally produce more sweat than women, which means you get larger populations of these bacterium. And that's why men in general are stinkier. However, <laughs> underarm body odor has specifically been linked to a gene called ABCC11. And that... <laughs> That encodes Sorry, a protein. Some, some scientist late at night was out of ideas. It's just like I don't, I don't care anymore, you guys. Yeah. A, B, C, one, two, three. Yeah, so exactly. this protein transports molecules across membranes, including sweat molecules. But if A, B, C, C eleven is non-functional, sweat molecules can't cross the membrane barrier to reach the armpit which starves bacteria of that fluid so they can't metabolize it. And therefore, you don't have odorant substances in your sweat. And this mutation of the lack of sweating or lack of odorant sweat is most common in East Asian populations. About 80 to 95% of East Asians, uh, you may not be able to metabolize alcohol as well, but you also yeah. don't have stinky <laughs> sweat. So, you know... <laughs> that's a pretty nice trade-off yeah so that's so cool so this is a cell surface transporter right so everything that gets into your sweat and oil and everything else like that it has to be processed or go through a cell and then has to come outside of the cell into the extracellular matrix and around there and then it has to gather into a sweat gland and then it, it, it excretes it with your oil and that kind of a thing right so of course you don't put those chemicals into your sweat and they're just not there. <laughs> so while most deodorants and antiperspirants on the market tend to focus on reducing the bacterial load or its byproducts, meaning your deodorant is by the flimsiest of rationales an antibiotic. Sure. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> okay. One interesting theory. Now this is, this is in some preliminary studies. Uh, Santosh, you know how we have talked in the past about fecal or stool transplants to cure C. diff? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And now it's, well, that one was an FDA approved treatment. And now we have FDA approved treatments for C. diff, which are essentially, you know, a transplant, but in a pill form. So now scientists are looking into using antibacterials to remove your armpit microbiome from a person Ooh. with BO and <laughs> replace it with bacteria from the armpit microbiome of a healthy donor, perhaps in East Asia. <laughs> oh, this is so cool. Okay. So by the way, there's going to be other reasons why, you know, BO happens. So you do have to sometimes make sure that we're not covering up another, you know, medical condition that's going on. Um, I famously, you know, if you are out of shape and you have things like obesity, you know, then, you know, you, it tends to follow along with, with BO or if there's an infection going on, you got to treat it properly. But if it's just, I guess it would be like idiopathic BO. <laughs> it would be, there's no other reason except your microbiome is a problem. Then I'm guessing this is one of these that if I have access and money to the right type of doctor and stuff, you could get this transplant. It's this... such early work. Just the idea that, oh, we'll just transplant your armpit microbiome, which is not a microbiome you hear talked about a lot, sure. even in a field where it's that's yeah, still developing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I just that's like so the idea cool. of like, we need an armpit transplant stat. <laughs> He doesn't have much time. <laughs> I can smell him from here. Go, go, go. <laughs> now let's detour a moment. I couldn't okay. do a smell-o-vision episode without talking about old people smell. 
Yeah, that's that's true. And it's very distinctive. We're not talking about like the added on smells like, you know, what you get in a like the mothballs or, you know, the, the dwelling that they live in. Just them. Themselves. No, just just the general smell that yeah. grandma or grandpa gives off. Mm-hmm. Okay. It's not it's not even necessarily an unpleasant one. And this this was some really interesting studies. So. In this study, in one study, a researcher named Lundstrom and his colleagues sewed absorbent nursing pads, again, into the armpits of t-shirts, and had volunteers of different ages sleep in the shirts for five consecutive nights. They then took these... Keeping the absorptive pads like there, like don't don't take them out kind of thing. Right. There were 44 volunteers. They divided them into three groups. Eight women and eight men between the ages of 20 and 30, those were the young. The same number of men and women between the ages of 45 and 55, middle-aged. Okay. And six men and women between 75 and 95, known to be elderly. Okay. During the day, they stored the t-shirts in sealed plastic bags avoided spicy food, cigarettes, and alcohol that could change their scent, showered with odorless shampoo shampoo and soap, and then a different group of 41 young men and women had volunteered their noses to sniff these various range of ages, and they would take a big whiff of air at the top of a jar while blindfolded, rating both the intensity and pleasantness of the odor. Oh, okay. Gotcha, gotcha. Now, they did this a couple different ways. Sometimes volunteers just had to choose which of two odors was most likely to come from the older one. Other times, they had to label a series of jars as young, middle age, or old age. Oh, okay, okay. So they, they mixed up the methods a little bit. To see, you know, if they could get the same kind of results with a different type of test. Got it, got it. Okay. Right, so it's more just like, oh, well, this one smells stronger. It's probably the old one. That's a 50-50 chance. Whereas if I right. give you six jars and I tell you, label which these, ones, got which it, ones got which. It, got it. So got that it, was done it. in an attempt to avoid uh, bias. Sure. At the end of this study, who do you think was the stinkiest? Um... <laughs> is this going to be another trick question? Uh, the young people. Middle-aged man musk took top prize for intensity and unpleasantness. Oh, okay. okay. Uh- <laughs> whereas, whereas middle-aged woman was most pleasant. Okay. And whiff of old man, greatest phrase I've ever seen in a scientific <laughs> paper. <laughs> That that has to be given to uh, like perfume manufacturers as a hey, would you like to patent this? <laughs> okay, whiff of old man. Sure. Whiff of old man was rated as least intense, meaning okay. old people have a distinctive smell, but not an unpleasant one. We actually don't mind the way old people smell. Okay, all right, very interesting. In case you're interested, these findings appear from plus one. In the May 30th of last year. Now, the Japanese even have a word for old people smell. Kareishu. Oh, okay. <laughs> or ka- kareishu. See, this is why I love linguistics. Because German has all these things that we all universally feel. But they've kind of put it into these things. And and here I'm learning that Japanese has the same kind of a thing. Yeah, Japan's like, okay. we have a lot of old people. We had to come up with a word for how they smell. We had to smell. come up with a word for the smell. Got it. <laughs> okay. So, yes, old people smell is a thing, but it's actually not a thing that most people mind. You're more likely to be offended, olfactorily offended, by middle-aged musk. Middle-aged man musk. Middle-aged man musk is another one that Old Spice has to pick up, maybe. (laughs) (laughs) That's the next Axe body spray. Oh, gross. Okay. So We'll call it dad bod. (laughs) (laughs) so let's wrap up the episode by talking very briefly about how you treat loss of smell 
Oh, uh, other than, well, kind of the obvious, like if you're stuffed up, like we got to help you get unstuffed, but you're well, talking about maybe like neurological diseases or. Well, sure. If you want to, you want to address the underlying condition, but for people, remember I told you earlier in the episode that about a quarter of COVID patients still hadn't regained their smell after 60 days. Sure. Okay. Well, gotcha. we're not going to let those people go forever without smelling what the rock is cooking. So instead, uh, sure. we give them something called smell retraining therapy, SRT. Ooh, oh, God, like like smell rehab. Yeah, smell rehab. Okay. And this was <laughs> this is pretty new. It was developed in 2009 by Dr. Thomas Hummel at the University of Dresden. Okay. And it involves repeated presentation of different smells through the nose to stimulate the olfactory system and establish memory. So you start with four different scents, specifically smells that you remember or will be familiar to you. So the ones they recommend the most, although you know your mileage may vary, are a floral smell like rose, a fruity smell like lemon, a spicy smell like cloves, and a more resinous smell like eucalyptus. So the kind of things you find in the Whole Foods aromatherapy aisle. Okay, got it. And, and I'm hearing a lot of the same stuff from the Sniff and Sticks, uh, you know. Uh, well, probably because he was inspired by these. But while those are you, where Sniff and Sticks are used to diagnose disease, they, Dr. Hummel recommends you choose four fragrances that you have attached to memory and gives those as examples. So you start with these four scents, you take a sniff of each scent for 10 to 20 seconds, at least once or twice a day, mm -hmm. and to concentrate on your memory of that smell. After each oh. scent, you take a few breaths to kind of clear your mind and your nose, and then you move on to the next fragrance. And it's recommended that this is done for 12 weeks or, you know, three months, although you can certainly do it longer. You're not going to injure yourself by over-smelling. <laughs> this is so so neat i i absolutely love this this is the same kind of concept that we talk about when you know you're rehabilitating your shoulder or something like that you not only are you know doing things for muscle and strength and that kind of thing but you actually are completing motions that are retraining your nerves to fire in the right order so that you don't, you know, impinge or hurt or whatever, you know, it is on the rotator cuff. You're retraining the motion. So this is the same kind of a thing is that you're retraining your smell receptors and the olfactory portion of your brain. This is so now, neat. Now you may wonder why those four scents were chosen, floral, fruity, spicy, and resinous. Well, that's okay. because you know how we have five different tastes, salty, sweet, bitter, sour, and savory? Uh-huh, yep. Researchers have categorized the smells as well into broad categories, which, as we said, floral, fruity, spicy, resinous. The two that we don't test, burnt and foul. So instead of having to practice smelling burnt or foul odors, Smell retraining concentrates on pleasant smells. Okay, very, very cool. All right, so kind of almost, if this works well, you can almost get... Once again, smell. Things. If it yeah. works well, you'll be down to smell. So <laughs> that's it for this week. I want you to go out into the world and smell all the things. As always, we love to hear your comments, questions, and feedback. If you'd like to support us spiritually, emotionally, or financially, links to do that are in the show notes, along with links for further reading. Our theme music is composed by Rachel Leisure. This show is produced by me with a lot of help from Dr. Santosh and friends. And uh, until next time, well, I suppose get out there and sniff something and then keep a song in your heart, soap on your hands, a shot in your arm. And when you've done all that, find a place to go and uh, happy travels. Bye, everybody.